Today, I want to pick it up in verse 5, okay? So if you'll find Daniel chapter number 8, uh, let's look at verse 5. Remember now this ram that is pushing to the north and to the west and to the south, great expansive power. And we found that to be true in history. Uh, the, the Persians took over in 539 uh, BC, and for the next 200 years, think about that, they held sway over the world, uh, that, that, that portion of the world at least. Uh, wow, that's a long time to be uh, a dominating world power, and so they were. Uh, but we're now going to skip forward in history a couple hundred years and look at the nation that destroyed Medo-Persia. So look at verse uh, number five. Uh, Daniel is speaking, and, and as I was considering, behold, remember what we said that the word behold means? It means suddenness, like all of a sudden. So this is something that's going to happen, uh, come on the scene quickly. The Bible says, and behold, and he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. So here we go again with animals and horns and suddenness and what in the world is happening? Well, the Bible's going to tell us. So it, the, the best interpreter of the Bible is the Bible. And that's something for us to keep in mind. Uh, it's unwise, and I'll just say this as an aside. It's unwise for us uh, when we teach the Bible, when we preach the Bible, uh, when we comment on the Bible. It's unwise for us to say things dogmatically that the Bible does not say. It's, sometimes if we're not careful, we'll almost have a mystical reading of the Bible. We'll make everything represent some, something. Uh, like the five stones of David. You know, we need to take the stone of faithfulness in our life and the stone of, if we want to win the battle, we need, to, we need to wield the stone of purity and the stone of, those things are true. We, we ought to be pure and we ought to be faithful and we ought to be courageous and we ought to be uh, whatever. But that's not what the stones of David represent. That's not, so we do the Bible a disservice when we make it to mean something that it doesn't mean, um, and to give it some kind of a, a mystical meaning, then we can make the Bible say whatever we want it to say. So especially is that true when we talk about prophecy. We don't want to make the Bible say something it doesn't say. We want to be very careful. Uh, when the Bible says something means something, then we can say that dogmatically. When the Bible says that this represents this, then we can say that dogmatically. For instance, we can say that the Passover represents Christ. Why? Because the Bible tells us that. It's not just a clear symbol, but the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it's Christ our Passover. Uh, we can say that Melchizedek represents Christ. Why? Because the Bible says so. So let's be very careful about what we say the Bible says or doesn't say. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that. Oh, yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the Bible says that one of the ways that we understand the Bible is by comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So it is important that we allow the Bible to be the best commentary on itself. And we find that right here in Daniel chapter number 8. So uh, Daniel sees this goat, this he goat. It has one horn. So I guess you would call that a unicorn, a, u u a unicorn. So this goat that kind of looks like a unicorn. Uh, don't get excited. Uh, those of you that are Disney princess fans, I'm sure it didn't look at all like a beautiful purple unicorn. Uh, but it's a strong animal. So the he goat is going to come up against the ram. So the ram has two horns. And the ram as an animal seems to be stronger than a goat. And yet a goat, when you think about a he goat or a mountain goat, you think about uh, an animal that is sure-footed, an animal that is swift, an animal that is um, savvy, right? Uh, who knows how to use a path that perhaps another animal couldn't use. 
And all of that is going to be true as we think about the Grecian Empire defeating the Medo-Persian Empire. So uh, let's see if we can understand a few of the, the factoids that God has given us here. Look at verse number five. So here's this goat. He's from the West. So that's the first, uh, well, actually the second clue that we have about Greece. First of all, Greece is often depicted as a goat. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Persia depicted as a ram. Uh, and then the goat is from the West. So that's where Greece came from, from the standpoint of Daniel, Greece is all the way to the west. So he comes from the west. And the Bible says on the face of the whole earth, so he's going to cover all of this ground. And the Bible says, and he touched not the ground. And the idea there is so quick, it's as if he's floating and levitating and flying across of the landscape. And that's really what Greece did. So Greece overtook the world in the 330s, three beginning in 340, 330s BC, uh, under the rule of Alexander the Great. So Greece was ruled by a one dictator, a young man in his 20s, the son of Philip of Macedon, so from Macedonia, and it was Alexander the Great, one of the greatest world leaders of all time, Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great was known for his, uh, his intelligence, his courage, but his speed, the speed. He, he really strategically defeated the Persians, not through might. He didn't have a mightier army, but he, 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 was, a, he was smarter. He was more strategic, and he was quick. So, wow, what an amazing prophecy so far. Look, look at verse number six. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him. See the speed? Ran unto him uh, in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close into the ram, and he was moved with, with choler, anger against him and smote the ram, and break his two horns, defeated the kingdom, um, broke his two, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground, stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Wow, what an amazing a Bible prophecy that this smaller power, this ostensibly weaker power, a goat compared to a ram, would defeat the ram through the strength of his ambition, the, the purposefulness of his mission, the speed with which he would, uh, which, with which he would conquer, uh, the rulership of one big strong power, the one horn. Uh, all of this happened. So Alexander the Great marched against the whole world. He defeated the whole world, including areas like Egypt. And, and, uh, but, but really, the, the world power was Persia. And he fought Persia in two great battles. Actually, more than that. We can go all the way back to the late 400s BC, uh, where Xerxes, the one that married Esther, had lost a great battle against Greece at the Battle of Salamis. It was a, a naval battle. Uh, and he, he came back, and that's when he came back and, and married Esther. So that, that's a whole different battle. But years later, under Alexander, uh, they fought the battle at Issus. So if you look at a map of the Mediterranean Sea and look in the northeastern corner of the Mediterranean Sea, like up by Cyprus, even northeast of Cyprus, there's a little strip of land called Issus uh, in Turkey, kind of where... Turkey turns the corner and you start coming down south, Lebanon, and eventually to Israel. Okay, in that corner, Issus, uh, Alexander defeated the Persians, but it wasn't the major battle. Uh, and then two years later, after having defeated Egypt, he met Persia on the plain of Guagamala. Gu Guagamala. I think it's Guagamala. Anyway, uh, Gagamala. Uh, Gagamela, something like that. But anyway, at that battle, the Persians had like a quarter million troops. 
I mean, they just vastly outnumbered the Grecians. And yet, and you can, you can actually look up a mock-up of this battle. Uh, there's a couple different ones if you want to YouTube it. It's amazing. And Alexander defeated the Persians through strategy, through speed, uh, through sheer willpower. It was an amazing victory for the Greeks. You say, wow, great Alexander. Wow, amazing strategy. Wow. But the wow is not Alexander. Uh, the wow is God. Because God is showing Daniel all of this. Daniel doesn't even know about the Greeks. Daniel has no clue about them. They're still way in the future for Daniel. And yet, what is God doing? He's showing that in the times of the Gentiles, when it seems that Israel is just going to be a little pawn, just a little footnote in world history, God is showing, no, Daniel, I am in control. And even though it looks like on the world stage, these are the big players, this ram and this goat, what I'm going to show you is that all of it, all of it is just the big backdrop against which I'm going to do my great work for my people. Now, do we see that in the king of, of Persia? Sure. As Cyrus sends the people back to rebuild the temple, uh, as Xerxes marries Esther and the whole story of Mordecai and Haman, as Artaxerxes gives the permission for Ezra to go back or Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the wall. We see God's fingerprints over all of it. In the Grecian Empire, we're going to see some horrible things happen to God's people, things that presage uh, Antichrist himself. And yet, what's true? God is orchestrating. God is pulling the levers. God is in control. And so tomorrow, Lord willing, we'll talk about this Grecian empire, how it came to power, what happened to Alexander the Great, uh, who took over for him, how that affected Israel, and how that plays into ultimate uh, prophecy in the end times. It is just so fascinating. And all of it points back to God's word is true and God is in control. So come back tomorrow, 10 o'clock. We'll talk about Antiochus Epiphanes and we'll talk about Antichrist and we'll talk about how all that relates to this world power that we call Greece. Hope to see you here tomorrow at 10. God bless you, my friends.